Um, I'm excited about where the army is going. I'm excited to start playing it, to be honest with you. And hopefully you'll see it on Reveling Ones here pretty soon. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for joining me. Let me know if you have any questions down below, and I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming. Okay, but, you know, in my defense, time works differently in the realm of chaos. Welcome, Wargamers, to The Deluge. If you have joined the channel in the last two years and have no idea what this is, essentially I started a series a long time ago following my construction of a maggotkin of Nurgle army. And so I wanted to do a project log and all these kinds of things, and a couple of things happened that I will talk about later that basically derailed me from that project and I moved on to other things. You know, I'm, I'm somebody who loves to hop army projects and, and paint all different kinds of stuff. But I thought, what more appropriate way to jump back into the deluge than with Games Workshop being kind enough to send me the Maggotkin of Nurgle Battle Tome. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about primarily today when it comes to that. Nothing to do about, um, you know, hobby progress or the projects going forward. I just really want to focus on the Battle Tome today. However... I just want to say thank you because they also sent me one of their new Vanguard boxes, and I will be doing a full review of this with the context of the new Battle Tomes to give you a sense of like what the value for money is here. Is it a good place to start? Um, so kind of like how I do my Star Collecting box reviews, I am going to do one for these as well. And then finally, there is the uh, Rotbringer Sorcerer, which is a great model, uh, and he's a cool little guy I'm excited to get into. So like I said, mostly today, we're just gonna focus on the Battle Tome. That really, really is the primary thing that I wanted to have a video out uh, for the day of the book. I, you know, I've, They kind of kept punting back the date on when I was allowed to talk about it. And so I wanted to have something ready. And of course they punted it back to a date when I have family in town and wasn't able to do a live stream. So I'm gonna make this video real quick and simple and sweet. And we're just gonna talk about some of the cooler things about this book, some high level what I see going on uh, with Maggotkin of Nurgle. I will say this, if you want a detailed, like literally someone reads you the book so you can listen to all of the rules and all of the command abilities, all that stuff, go check out our, uh, Ash Barker from Gorilla Miniature Games. Um, I don't get his links early, so I can't put it in the description for when this video go lives. But when he does Battle Tome reviews, he just, he reads them. He does a great service for the community. People love it. This is more of a high level. I'm gonna talk about the feel of the book, kind of what I think they were going for, and what kind of armies you can make from it. Right before we dive into this, just as a side note, I wanna say, the reason I stopped the Magakin project primarily was because of my basing. If you are curious as to why I stopped, it's because I did custom, you know, rolled out Green Stuff World bases on every single one of them, and it got to the point where it became such a hassle to add any units to the faction that I, I didn't want to do the project anymore. I just got burnt out. So, with the resetting of the Deluge, I have to decide if I'm going to keep doing that basing project scheme or move into something different. Either way, I'm excited to get back into the pus-filled goodness that is Nurgle. So with that out of the way, let's go to the downward cam, check this puppy out. So here we have the Maggotkin of Nurgle Battle Tome, especially for third edition. Now the lore stuff, of course, I'm going to be doing a lore week. Uh, I have family in town right now, so I haven't been able to record, but I will do those things very, very soon, I promise. We see a couple new pieces of art, a lot of the stuff that we've seen before. Uh, and there are some really cool things that kind of put Nurgle's place in specifically the realm of Guran into context. This is the first time we really see a good map of where Nurgle's forces and or influence are. So that's pretty much it for the, the lore side is what I'm going to talk about today. You know, they didn't really add any units. I mean, they, we got a new model for the uh, sorcerer, but he was actually already there. It's just an older one that didn't look as good. And so I'm going to skip past that a bit. They still have a fantastic model gallery as well as painting tutorial section. And we're going to move straight into the battle traits. Now, one thing I want to say very much up top. This hobby, miniature wargaming and specifically Games Workshop as a hobby, is in a state of constant change. Okay, Anytime a new battle tome comes out or codex for a 40k army, things change. The army is different. The best players in this game see it as a new challenge and they rise to the occasion. The worst parts of our hobby just stagnate and complain about how things were better before. That's my opinion. So you're going to see a lot of vitriol online about people who, I didn't like this change, I don't like that change. If you like it, awesome. If you are cool enough to, to rise to the challenge of what new options are available to you because 
They took away some things, but they always give you new tools. Those are the folks I, I, I just encourage you to listen to rather than just straight negativity. That's just my opinion. Um, I'm going to do a quick high-level view of what I think the book is, and then as we're going through the different pages, uh, that's that'll kind of act as my, you know, my supporting uh, evidence of it. So my thesis here is quite simply that Nurgle used to be a very speedy and aggressive army with a potential to do a lot of mortal wounds. The reason it was speedy is because there were a lot of movement buffs, as well as, of course, the Feculent Narma, which allowed you to run in charge if you were within seven inches of it. So, when I played Maggot King of Nurgle last, I really focused heavily on Puscoil Blightlords, specifically because I could make those big walls of wounds, it's just two models in the unit, but my god, between deep striking from the sky and getting additional movement from the Lord of Affliction's, you know, movement abilities, they were in your face. I had very reliable turn one charges every single game. So like speed was, you know, the name of the game before for me. That has changed. That has gone away. And that sucks. To be honest, if you know, if that's kind of what I was building my whole collection around, it would stink. What we got replacing it, however, is an army that is far, far more durable than they used to be. Um, we ha still have tons of ways to deliver mortal wounds. They're in a different way now, as we're going to touch on with the way diseased mechanics work, but we have that. There's also a ton more potential to actually make summoning useful. To me, Nurgle was one of the best chaos god-specific battle tomes, like Disciples of Zine, Sheep, Night Slanesh, Blades of Corn. Magikin of Nurgle was always on the weakest of that scale when it came specifically to summoning, because of the way that the Feculent Naramaz worked. I think that the chart for spending, um, was it Contagion Points, is kind of their, their token that they use to, uh, you spend those and that's how you can summon stuff. They were a pain in the butt to get. I felt like the prices that, you know, in Contagion Points was way off, so the most you would ever summon is either another Feculent Naruma or a five-man squad of Plague uh, bearers. Yeah. So I think that that has radically changed to the point where there is a true summoning list in this book. And that is what I want to play. I want to play a mortal army that has an aggressive stance with summoning. And that's possible now. And it, it was just not a real option before, not because it didn't exist in the book, but because there was just very few mechanisms to be able to meaningfully interact with how summoning worked. So, uh, you know, I'm a glass half full guy. I lost something that was absolutely the way I would have played before, but I gained something new and exciting, and I just invite you to have that same opinion. So let's go ahead and talk about their allegiance abilities. So there's stuff we already know, like you can choose a sub-faction. All the sub-factions that were introduced in, uh, was it Wrath of the Everchosen, are now here, complete in their book, which is just a blessing. I love that so much. And we're introduced first off to their core idea called Diseased. This is a brand new mechanic and I freaking love it, okay? Essentially, this, um, how do I want to word this? Yeah, actually, you know what, I'll just read it. I'll just read the whole thing. So, at the end of the movement phase and at the end of the combat phase, give one disease point, it's like a little marker, to each enemy unit that is within three inches of any Maggotkin of Nurgle units. So, pause, Maggotkin of Nurgle units, it's not gonna affect if you bring Slaves to Darkness in your coalition. Um, it, it, those things won't break you from having a Maggotkin of Nurgle army, but they don't have the Maggotkin of Nurgle keyword. So it's just stuff in this book. Um, a unit can have a maximum of seven disease points at any one time, and it cannot be given any more until it has been reduced to less than seven. At the start of the battle shock phase, for each disease point that an enemy unit has, you must take, sorry, you must make one dice roll called the disease roll for each four up the that enemy unit suffers one mortal wound at the end of the battle shock phase reduce the number of disease points each enemy has uh to one and then as a designer's note once a unit is quote unquote infected meaning they've had some interaction with a, a magakin of nurgle unit uh they basically always carry forth one disease point into the next rounds and of course you know let's say it's my turn and i put three disease points on a unit when it goes to, you know, after the Battleshock phase, they do or do not take mortal wounds, and they just go down to one. And then the next round, in my opponent's turn, they'll accrue more, because it's not your movement phase and combat phase, it is just 
the movement phase and combat phase. So every single turn, you're going to be accruing and you know spending is kind of the wrong word, but rolling to do mortal wounds based on how many disease tokens you have put on the board. Now we're going to look at these next two things that are very ancillary to it. Diseased weapons. If the unmodified hit roll for an attack made with a missile weapon or a melee weapon by a friendly maggot kin of Nurgle model is six, that attack inflicts one disease point on the target in addition to any normal damage. This is incredible. Okay, so this the fact that now we're we have something to fish for. Sixes will always do something, even if it's the crappiest of attacks. That's going to become very relevant for creatures like Nurglings here in a little bit. I love it. Um, one thing that I think is a unique kind of take when it comes to these design books, or sorry, the design of the current third edition battle tomes, is this idea of healing disease points. When a player uses an ability that allows them to heal any wounds that have been allocated to a unit, for each wound that they are allowed to heal, they can instead remove one disease point from that unit. Now, this in and of itself is not a massive rule. There's not like a ton of like very, very aggressive healing lists in an art, you know, in the current thing. There's soul blight grave lords who can bring stuff back or heal uh, multi wound summonable models. Uh, you have, obviously have a lot of stormcast stuff and sylvaneth that can heal things and add wounds. But what I like about this is. You know, the rest of these things are your rules for Maggotkin of Nurgle, but it's it's kind of one of the first books that I've seen that, like, it gives your opponent something, too. Like, hey, you know those kind of, you know, uh, special rules for healing and stuff that you might ignore on your Lord Relictor? All of a sudden, that becomes a lot more useful, and I like that. I like, you know, obviously this whole book is about Maggotkin of Nurgle, but in facing them, every time you face against this army, you get a little something, too. You may not have access to it, that's dependent on your list, but it's a cool idea. So there's that. Um, as far as Legions of Chaos go, that is just telling you that you can have two in every four units can be from Slaves to Darkness, but they have to have the Nurgle mark. One in every four can be from Clan Pestilence, which is huge because, good golly, you want to talk about ways of barfing out sixes to hit? Good gravy. Um, and then, actually, that wouldn't work because they're not Magakin of Nurgle. They are just... Nurgle. So that's interesting. I thought about that as I was uh, saying it out loud. And then finally, one in every four can be from Beasts of Chaos, as long as it doesn't have the Zinch keyword. So no Zangor stuff. Now over here, we have our disgustingly resilient. Before, demon models, uh, I should say some models had a rule called disgustingly resilient, which allowed them to shrug off wounds. It's basically a ward save, right? It, it's, it's all it was. But a lot of the mortal stuff, in fact, I say most of it didn't. Um, with the exception of Pusco of Blight Lords, because they got that rule from riding the Demon Flies. But now, friendly Maggotkin of Nurgle models have a ward of five up, just flat, across the board. In addition, at the start of your hero phase, you can heal one wound allocated to each friendly Maggotkin of Nurgle model. That is huge. That is a huge increase in the efficiency of Disgustingly Resilient. Not only are you now shrugging a third of the wounds that come at you with the five up, but also you, you know, your opponent has to do additional wounds to be able to finish off a unit. Because if they leave someone with one wound left or you know one wound taken, they heal right back up. And it's every unit. Every hero, every thing of Nurglings, every thing of Blight Kings, all of it. And that is cool. Also is the Locus of Fecundity. And we saw this uh, introduced in, I believe it was Wrath of the Ever Chosen as well, where um, the following units are each a Locus of Fecundity. The Great and Clean One, Horticula Slimex, the Glotkin, and Festus the Leech Lord. Disgustingly resilient battle traits heal D3 mortal wounds, sorry, wounds, uh, allocated to a model instead of one if that model's unit is wholly within 14 inches of any locus of fecundity so it, they kind of took it away it used to be this thing where like um small heroes of nurgle would have a little aura around them i think zinch still does that now they kind of got away with that but then they're like okay but we're taking the big centerpiece heroes and not i don't mean like the physically large models festus leech lord is super tiny compared to the glotkin but you know he represents a, a focal point of nurgle power those guys can emit a huge bubble. The Glotkin is a huge base. And so a 14-inch bubble around him 
with you know units that are between 10 five guys you know some of those things it, it's a huge amount of the board and your army that he's going to cover with that so that is really cool and lastly with this section we have the summoning demons of nurgle this is basically how you accrue and spend your contagion points that allow you to summon demons to the field now very very quickly at the start of your hero phase you receive three uh contagion points uh, if there are any friendly magakin units wholly within your territory so you should almost always get at least three per round and three um contagion points if there's any friendly models uh let's see wholly within your opponent's territory so the minute you start pushing forward like you would for an objective or something like that you're going to be getting six minimum if you receive any contagion points for a territory and there are no enemy models in that territory you receive one extra contagion point now what this is doing for you is when the game first starts right first hero phase let's say it's your you go first you get three for having models in your side of the table and you're going to not get anything because you haven't yet moved stuff into your opponent's side of the table unless you have pre-game moves which do exist in addition, because there's no enemies near you or in, on your side of your like you know your area, your your zone, you're going to get an additional one, and that just keeps going every single time. Now it's always uh, let's see here at the start of your hero phase, so you're not accruing them when your opponent is going, and that's totally cool. When you go to use these, you just kind of keep track of how many you have. You know, get a d20 or something like that. Um, when you do that, if you have any CP at the end of your movement phase, you can summon one unit or terrain feature from the list below. Um, it has to, you have to have the cost, deduct it from there. You don't have to spend all of them, so you can save some and, and bank some, which I like. Uh, new units must be set up more than nine inches from all enemy units and wholly within seven inches of a Magkin of Neural Hero or wholly within seven of a Feculent Gnarl Maw. And then there's some rules for feculent gnarl maws. You have to set that up basically seven inches away from any other feculent gnarl maws and more than three inches from all models, objectives, and other things. Just basically, you just can't have it within three inches of anything and it has to be at least seven away from other trees. And I like that because it doesn't clog a lot of board space. It kind of keeps things somewhat manageable and you can't plop a tree down, you know, on something to specifically cause mortal wounds. Now, when we look at the, the summoning things, the actual like what you can summon and how much it costs when we look at the contagion points it starts at seven goes all the way up to 30 uh, which actually with this system and, and some of the other buffs that you can get in this book is quite reasonable i think i think it's quite all right um so you can get a heroes yeah it's slotty sloppy bile piper and the spoil pox scrivener both heralds of nurgle come in at seven so if you just need a support piece something that has that maggotkin of nurgle keyword to trigger some stuff that's awesome Nurgling Swarms, which we'll cover, uh, are 8. Feculent Naroma is 9, which is actually, in my opinion, good, because I didn't like that it was one of the cheapest things you could summon before. Um, a single Beast of Nurgle is 10. Poxbringer, the different Herald of Nurgle, is 12. And a Plaguebearer Host with 10 models is 14. A Plague Drone set of 3 models is 18. And then, of course, the Great Unclean one is 30. Now that doesn't look, you know, vastly different from the list that we had before, but with the the different ways that you can accrue points, I do think it will go much, much faster. You'll be able to rack them up faster and therefore actually use summoning in a meaningful way. And the last thing as far as allegiance abilities go is we did keep the wheel. Okay, so you have all that stuff before. The way that, um, po is it poison? No, disease. That's what it was. Diseased and you can summon stuff. We also have the wheel, and the wheel did change quite a bit in terms of there's less stuff that has to do with speed uh, and, and just kind of a general change to it. So basically it works the same in that at the start of the first battle round, you roll a die, and there you go. You consult your chart. So we're going to go in order. So it's one through six plus an extra one because it's just one you can't roll for. So unnatural vitality, all Magakin of Nurgle have a ward of four up instead of five up for their disgustingly resilient that's nasty. Uh, fecund Vigor. All units are treated as being within 14 inches of a locus of fecundity, meaning they're all going to be able to heal D3 wounds instead of 1. At the start of your hero phase, roll a number of dice equal to the number of the current battle round for each 4-up. You receive 1 extra CP, which is pretty nice. And the fact that you know there's ways to make... You can manipulate the wheel 
And so you can come back to this if you know you're going to have a CP intensive round. Um, Plague of Misery. Heroes that do not have the Nurgle keyword cannot carry out heroic actions or issue the rally or inspiring presence commands. That is a ball buster. Okay, I'm just going to be honest with you. That is a curb stomp for some factions. Um, especially when you're talking, you know, depending on the size of games that you play. For me, I play a lot of 1,000 to 1,500 point games. Uh, that is savage at those levels when you don't have other means necessarily with points wise of, of fitting in good synergies to protect your unit. So that's crazy. I love it. Um, nauseous revulsion subtract one from the charge rolls for enemy units that do not have the nurgle keyword enemy units that do not have the nurgle keyword cannot finish a pile and move closer to a friendly nurgle unit than they were at the start of the move so it's just a real great way of mitigating it if you are a maga kind of nurgle player and you're going against a huge horde who is not nurgle so not a clan pestilence army or something it's a great way to mitigate getting absolutely dumpstered by a bajillion attacks because they can't wrap around you in the same way. They have to stay pretty much where they are. Then there's Rampant Disease, which is add one to disease rolls that you make, which means now for every time you, you know, in your battle shock phase or rolling to see if your diseased weapons and stuff do damage, it's on a three up rather than a four up. That is cool. And the last one here is Corrupted Growth. At the start of a hero phase, you receive one extra CP for each feculent gnarl ma in your army that is on the battlefield. So you can't roll for that one, but you know, you're gonna, generally speaking, at least get one, right? Because you'll get at least one just for showing up and taking Magakin of Nurgle as a rule set. So, you know, depending on how you want to lean into the various things with, with summoning and, and using feculent gnarl ma's, that's gonna be a great one to have. Now, I'm not going to go through every single of the enhancements. I'm just going to pick out a few that I think are meaningful. Um, for example, you still have some of the old classics, like, you know, once per battle at the start of the battle round, you can move the cycle of corruption pretty much just one step uh, around where it is currently. That's great for controlling this and controlling your opponent because these are all board wide, which is really, really nice. Um, Infernal Conduit basically gives you a chance to get more and more Contagion points if this general is on the battlefield at the start of the hero phase. Uh, it's your hero phase specifically. Roll a die and on a 1, nothing happens. On a 2 through 5, you get 1 Contagion point. On a 6, you get D3. So that's just one more way to rack those up. Um, let's see. There's a, a few ways to give more or additional Contagion points or disease points to other people. At uh, the start of your hero phase, roll a dice for each enemy unit within 7 inch of this general. On a 2 up, give that unit 1 disease point and you receive 1 contagion point. So if you have a hero who can move up and be aggressive, I could see this being really great on a Lord of Afflictions. I'm sorry, yeah, mortal hero, yeah, so we can do this. Um, he can run up there, he can be protected by his boys, the other Pusco Blight Lords, but he's still within 7 and so he can be dishing out mortal wounds and getting him more contagion points. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that has to do with making them more tanky. On the demon side, uh, let's see. He's got some buffs to their attacks characteristics, subtracting hit rolls, uh, from hit rolls from your opponent as they're hitting you. And, uh, Pestilent Breath, which is just essentially like a, an, an extra weapon that they can get as a command trait. An extra attack, I should say, rather than a weapon. Now we look at the, uh, artifacts here, and of course there's the Nurgle and uh, the demon. Now it's interesting for, they used to have mortal, magkin of Nurgle and demon. But maybe I misread something and the mortals can take these. Let me know in the comments below. Cause this is like the way that they've worded uh, enhancements to me is still a little bit muddled. Um, but I mean, I'm only ever gonna play like, if I'm gonna play magkin of Nurgle, I'm not bringing slaves to darkness. I want these guys. That's just kind of how my brain works. So I look at this as like, oh yeah, I can take all of these. Um, we have some great, I mean, honestly, great stuff. Rustfang is still here once per battle at the start of the combat phase. You can pick one enemy hero within three inches of the bear, subtract one from save rolls that target that hero for the rest of the battle. That is a colossal stomp because Rustfang used to be incredibly good. It, it got toned down a lot. Now it's basically just pick a hero, screw that hero, and that's that's all there is to it. It used to be like whole units. Oh man, it was so beautiful. You can, sorry, here we go. Shield of Growths. You can reroll save rolls for attacks that target the bearer if the save roll is equal to or less than the number of wounds allocated 
to the bear. So that is situational, but it could be a really powerful shield. Um, there's a couple of once per battle things. Honestly, artifacts, typically not my, my big thing. We're going to move right here. And spell lores. Uh, Blades of Putrefaction used to be, or Putrefaction, sorry, used to be one of the go-tos because it would just make your sixes explode into madness. Let's see. Blades of Putrefaction is a spell that has a casting value of 7 and a range 14. If cast, pick one friendly Magakin of Nurgle unit within range and visible to the caster. To your next hero phase, each attack made with a missile weapon or melee weapon that inflicts one disease point on the target on an unmodified hit roll of a 5 or 6. So it's just modifying the disease roll that you do, which I like. I mean, honestly, it's a mechanic already built into the book. I like when there's different ways of manipulating it. So I think that's cool. Um, it's Plague Squall. Plague Squall is a casting value of six. If cast, roll seven dice for each six. You can pick one different enemy unit that is visible to the caster. Give it a disease point. That, I love it. That's the kind of stuff I'm here for, where it's just like, it's table-wide, as long as the spellcaster can see what's going on, you know, nothing's going to hide from the Glotkin. He's way too tall. Pick a, pick a couple of units, that guy gets a disease point. Is it great? Not really. Is it fun? Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, looking at the different Plague Legions, I feel like most of them still have kind of the same vibe that they did before, but there are some some real standouts here. Uh, for example, the Beneficent Wanderers, there's kind of like demon-focused ones and then mortal-focused ones, if you can kind of divide it that way in your head. So for the Munificent Wanderers, um, if an enemy unit is within three inches of a Munificent Wanderers Plaguebearer host, meaning Plaguebearer unit, they just changed the name to host, that has 10 or more models at the end of the movement phase, it receives two disease points instead of one. Okay, that's pretty cool. That's a great way just, if you can body spam and just rack up more disease points, all it does is just add to Plaguebinger strengths. A Befouling Host, which is the second one, uh, that has a Demon General, can include two Feculent Gnarl Maws instead of setting up one. Fantastic. Uh, we'll talk about Feculent Gnarl Maws. I'm going to skip ahead and talk about those before we start talking about other units, because it's a big change. The Droning Guard. Subtract one from hit rolls for attacks that target Plague Drones in the first battle round uh, and in the battle round in which they were set up. So if you bring them in from the sky by some means... Put them on the table afterwards. Whenever they come onto the table or the first round, they are minus one to be hit. Now, it is very specific to Plague Drones, which I feel like they used to have a little bit more oomph. Um, like the Droning Guard specifically did more for them, but minus one to be shot, pretty dang good right now. Now we have the Blessed Sons up here, uh, which is sort of the, I guess, the generic Magakin of Nurgle Mortals. Uh, typically, all the heroes and stuff are from the Blessed Sons, that's why I say that. If a friendly Blessed Sun's mortal, mortal model is slain within one inch of an enemy unit before removing that model from play, pick one enemy unit within one inch of that model and roll a number of dice equal to the wound's characteristic of that model. For each six, the enemy gets a disease point. This, to me, turns Maggotkin of Nurgle into Stormcast. Stormcast have that ability that when they get killed, number of wounds, roll a die on a six, it does a mortal wound to somebody within an inch. And so I kind of look at that the same way, except they're just feeding this further into the mechanics that were already established early on, which I like, to be honest. Um, you know, when you figure a Blight King has, they still have four wounds, let's see. Four wounds. So, you know, you're going to be rolling enough of them, certainly with putrid uh, Puscoil Blight Lords and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it, it, it will come into effect, especially if you want to have a melee-focused army. Then there are the Drowned Men, which this is what my faction really was before. They used to give you all kinds of bonuses to movement and be very aggressive with Pusquil Blight Lords. And simply here, after deployment but the first battle round begins, you can move each friendly Drowned Men, Lord of Afflictions, and Pusquil Blight Lords unit up to 8 inches. If you both have it, just roll off and see who goes first. So, I like it. Um, to me, it sucks a lot of the wind out of the sails. Haha, <laughs> pun intended. Because uh, they're sea pirates. Um, out of it for me. Because it, it's not the kind of motion and aggressiveness that I, I wanted from the first kind of version of John Men. So I don't think I would lean heavily too much into Plusco of Light Lords this time around. But I do like them still. And then the last one for the mortals is the Filthbringers. 
Uh, you can include rock covens in your army, page 104, at the start of the hero phase. You can pick one wizard from each rock coven in your army, add one to casting and unbinding uh, and dispelling rolls for that wizard in that phase. Add two instead if one of those wizards is within three inches of one other wizard from the same rot coven. Add three instead, okay, just the more wizards you have in close to each other, the stronger that bonus gets. But let's take a look at the rot coven, page 104. What we essentially get is there's the rot bringer sorcerer, the single model, but specifically for the filth bringers, they have a different unit entry that is 360 points, Single can only be included in a Filthbringer's army. These units must be taken as a set referred to as a Rot Coven. Although taken uh, as a set, each is a separate unit. You essentially get three sorcerers for a discount. They're at 360 points. And um, basically, they, yeah, they function like it dictates here. This is the only place that mentions the Rot Coven. It's just, it's specifically a group of wizards that give each other a buff if they're close. So you can have this nice power base of, of wizards. You pick one each round, depending on how many from that Rot Coven are around them, they get bonuses to cast, unbind, dispel, all that kind of stuff. So if you're looking for magic, that's a great one to have. Now there is a Path to Glory section. I'm gonna do a dedicated video talking about that because I actually like it quite a bit. And we're gonna talk about the core of this. So we have core battalions, um, battle tactics, grand strategies, all these kinds of things. Go listen to Man Who Reads Book, Ash, uh, over on Grail Miniature Games. He does a great job of just reading it off. Me, I will lose my voice, and I've got a lot of catching up on content to do with my family around. So the one that really matters to me specifically is the Rotbringer Cyst, which is going to basically be a, a Rotbringer leader, so mortal maggot kind of Nurgle leader with a wounds characteristic of less than 10, which is most of them, and uh, three mortal maggot kin of Nurgle units. That's not a leader, it's not artillery or a behemoth. And so it's just basically a, uh, makes them a one drop mortal army. Doesn't that sound cool? It sounds cool to me. Um, as far as the other one, which is basically just three grand clean ones. They still have the thrice bold befoulment, which is fun. Um, they do magnificent. When you pick your enhancements, you get an extra one. So it's a lot more tame than the last ones, but hey, they are quite cool. Um, now for different actual war scroll entries, you know, they're going to go up on the app here uh, pretty, pretty much immediately, I think, after this video is released. Rather than going through and, and reviewing each one of them, I was actually going to do a video specifically talking about, okay, we're gonna tackle demons today, we're gonna tackle mortals today. Because to me, what I would say is the, one of the issues that I had with the, the last battle tome was it really felt like you had to lean in one direction. You had to lean into mortals and go with the battalions that buffed uh, Blight Kings to a bazillion. Or you had to go demons and you had to really lean into thrice full befoulment and spell casting and all that kind of stuff. What I would say about the new book is I do feel like it does a much better job of balancing the two. And when I mean balancing, I don't mean like, you know, that this is like a perfectly balanced army and it needs no point changes or clarifications or FAQs. When I say balanced, I mean, I don't feel railroaded into choosing mortals or demons. I personally like mortal stuff. But because of that, with the last book, I never got to play with any of the demons because the summoning mechanic was so terrible. Uh, I didn't feel like I was really accruing enough contagion points to be able to meaningfully summon things. And so between, you know, Feculent and Aromaz, some of the spells and abilities and that kind of stuff, I really do feel like summoning will be more meaningful with this army. It's not going to be like, you know die hard fast, but it will be a lot more meaningful. So I feel like I'll get a chance to engage with both halves of the army more so than I did in the last book. That's my personal opinion. We'll see how it goes on the tabletop. Uh, Horticulus Slimex still uh, once per battle lets you poop out a tree within three inches. Pretty cool. We have, let's see, the Beasts of Nurgle, I think got some really cool stuff. They used to be this weird kind of dumpy in the middle of the road unit where they they were aggressive and could get there, but they couldn't do anything. They had hit like a wet pool noodle. Uh, for this, now he can run, retreat, and still charge later in the same turn. In addition, when this unit retreats, it can pass across other models in the same manner as a model that can fly. So that's cool. And when he does that, he has a slime trail. Roll a dice for each enemy unit within three inches of this unit. On a four up, it suffers a disease point. 
That's cool. Um, after a model in this unit finishes a charge move, roll a dice for each enemy that's within an inch of it. On a two up, it suffers D3 mortal wounds. If that unit has more than one model, roll to determine if mortal wounds are caused after each model finishes its charge move, but do not allocate mortal wounds. Yeah, if you have a bunch of these guys in a single unit and they all pile in, you're just gonna roll for each of them really quick, but you don't apply it to the damage until you determine how many wounds are being spread. That way your guy, your opponent can't pull models out of range and therefore deny you charge things. All your charges are gonna go off, then you calculate how many wounds are done. Now, Nurglings are super fun. I love Nurglings. They're just, they're, they're adorable. Four inch move, four wounds, bravery 10, six up save, which is a better save than they deserve because Griffhound's got nothing. <laughs> um, so melee weapons, tiny sharp teeth, they get five attacks, fives to hit, fives to wound, no rend, one damage, the saddest profile in all of Warhammerdom. But endless swarm. At the end of the Battleshock phase, heal all the wounds that have been allocated to this unit. So each of those little swarm bases heals back up all the way at the end of the round. Hidden infestations. During deployment, instead of setting up this unit on the battlefield, you can place it to one side and say that it will set up a hidden infestation as a reserve unit. If you do so at the end of your first movement phase, you must set up this unit on the battlefield wholly outside of your territory within three inches of a terrain feature more than nine from all enemy units. So they are slow and they are derpy but they can like basically um hide out in terrain pre-game which is really nice because then you can pop stuff up you can have them be close to an objective to get early holds that's actually a really great move it's much better than like a scout move a pre-game thing I, I would much rather have this i like it a lot now realistically you know if you have three stands in this it's 15 attacks that's pretty reasonable to get all three of them in you're not looking to do damage you're looking to put on disease points okay that's all that's reasonable expectations they're gonna hide in terrain pop up clap an objective round one force your opponent to pull themselves way forward to get these guys off that objective or you know away from near it so they're not even threatening it and then they're just gonna fish for sixes if you expect anything else from these guys i'm sorry i don't know how to help you <laughs> Uh, and then we have Plague Drones, which I think are still pretty killy. Um, I wish they had more rend, but essentially a lot of these things are focused on delivering disease points and, and mortal wounds via that way. The attack's characteristics of a death's head is equal to the number of models in the target unit to a maximum of seven. So they actually do have some weirdly good close range shooting. It's only a range seven, but you know, if you pile drive a whole unit into, these, uh, into your enemy, you can actually get a lot of attacks out of that. Um, let's see, Plague Sword, you get the Clowing Mouth parts. Again, when I'm looking at these profiles, it's not just how well do the actual profiles look, like to hit and to wound and rend and damage, but it's also how many attacks, because that is a huge deal to me. How many attacks are they throwing? How many chances do I get to get sixes for disease points? Now, let's talk Glockin. He's one that I do want to focus on. Um, what I would say for the Glockin is they took him from uh i'm gonna say a, a trio of trophy husbands which are like they look good but they don't do a whole lot and turned them into uh what is closer to a god tier character okay like when i say god tier i mean these huge models that have a very meaningful impact on the game and they are priced to fit and so chaboy chaboys collectively are now 700 points okay which is huge that's that sucks but what do you get for that well Five inch move, uh, 20 wounds and a four up save, nine bravery. Not, no, that's good. He's a fat, slow wrecking ball. Um, the missile weapon is Otto's gut spray, which is, I love it. 12 inch range. The attacks, let's see, starts at seven and it degrades from there. Threes to hit, threes to wound, minus two rend and one damage. This used to be the one where you got like one shot and it almost never landed, <laughs> at least for me. Uh, he was just useless. But it had an incredible rend and incredible damage. And they kind of just tweaked it around. So now it's like more attacks, but they don't quite do as much. Which is fine. You know, it's whatever. Melee weapons. We have Girk's Tentacle. He starts at four attacks. Threes to hit, twos to wound, minus two rend and three damage. That thing is nasty. Um, Girk's Lamprey Maw. Three attacks. Threes to hit, twos to wound, minus two rend, three damage. You don't want him getting into you. 
Um, keep in mind the tentacle attacks, those degrade, but nothing degrades about the Lamprey Maw. And then lastly is Otto's Scythe, the guy on top with the big scythe that this picture cropped out, or covered up rather. Four attacks, threes to hit, threes to wound, minus one and rend, and d3 damage. So he is, I think, far scarier in melee than he was before. Okay. As far as what degrades, it's just the number of attacks when it comes to the ranged attack and the tentacle arm. Basically, that gets weaker as he goes. That's it. So he has a lot of ways to meaningfully deliver, you know, threes to hit, twos to wound, uh, ren to three damage weapons. Nice. So let's talk about his abilities. War Master. If this unit is included in a Magakin of Nurgle army, it is treated as a general, even if it is not the model to be picked as the general. We saw that starting in the Soul Blight book, I believe. And I like it just because it gives you ways to like ha include characters, but like they're not s saddled to that being your general. So like thematically, these guys would always be in charge. And if you did a thematic list before, you wouldn't be able to use any of the enhancements because named characters can't use them. So I like that change. Uh, he's a wizard because of one brother here and uh he can attempt to cast two spells and attempt to unbind two spells i like that uh he has the rule blight krieg uh you can use this command ability at the end of the movement phase sorry at the end of the enemy movement phase uh if this unit is within 12 inches of an enemy unit the command must be issued by this unit and it must be received by another another friendly maggotkin of neural unit that's within 12 inches of an enemy unit this unit and the unit that it received the command can attempt a charge. So essentially, if the Glotkin and the rest of your Nurgle forces are moving up at the end of your opponent's movement phase, you get a chance to counter charge. So you can pull in more of their units into engagement than they had expected, or you could double down. Like let's say your opponent only charges you once, you can then counter charge to really smoke that unit. So. It's cool. It's just a utility thing. It's not going to come up and be useful every game, but it is a very useful thing for kind of, certainly you can put your opponent on tilt. Uh, next is Horrific Opponent. At the start of the enemy movement phase, you must roll 2d6 for each enemy unit that's within 3 inches of this unit. If the roll is equal to or greater than that unit's bravery characteristic, that unit must retreat in that phase or it suffers d6 mortal wounds. So that is interesting that there's still a choice. I like that it's in your uh, enemy movement phase. It doesn't happen in yours, which is nice. So um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's just, it's either more damage or you're controlling what they do. And anytime you can take decisions away from your opponent or deliver damage just because they happen to be near him is good stuff. Mountain of Loathsome Flesh. You can carry out this monstrous rampage, which is interesting. Uh, with this unit instead of any other monstrous rampage you can carry out with for this unit. That's a very strange way to word that. If you do so, pick one enemy unit within three inches of this unit and roll a dice. On a two up, the enemy unit suffers a number of mortal wounds equal to the Mountain of Loathsome Flesh value on its damage table. That is the third thing that degrades as you take damage. So, uh, if somebody charges into you, you have the option... Sorry, um... Yeah, it's at the end of the charge phase. So, I mean, that's when monsters rampages happen. It's just one more way to do damage, which I like. Um, and honestly, it makes him quite scary. Uh, it makes him quite scary because that way you know whatever you charge into this guy, it has to be able to endure whatever profile he's at. And so it starts at five. On a two up, suffers five mortal wounds. Barf, I love it. And then there's Abundance of Flesh. This is the spell that uh, Ethrak, the glot, the wizard here knows. Has a casting value of 6, range of 14. Pick a friendly Magakin of Nurgle Mortal unit uh, within range and visible to the caster. Add 1 to their wounds characteristics. That's exactly what it was before, at least in terms of the effect. So I like that quite a bit. Um, and there's a designer's note. It can cause models to go above... Like when it, when it falls off, if a model had a wound, they only had one wound they'll just die. So things can die because of it, but in general, it makes things far more tanky. Um, we have our new Rotbringer Sorcerer, which I love the model for. And I really want to talk about uh, the Putrid Blight Kings because they really are a lot of the baseline of the army, as well as the Feculent Gnarl Maw. So let's start, actually let's start with the Gnarl Maw. Um, 
setup, it kind of works the same after territories are determined, but um, you can set up this faction terrain feature wholly within your territory and more than three inches from all objectives, other terrain features, and the spells and so on. If both players can do it, you roll off. So it's a little bit different in the sense that um, now, before it used to be, you put it on the table and then you determine deployment zone. So it could be in yours, it could be not. It's always safe to put it in the middle. Now it's always on your side, um, three inches away from a whole bunch of stuff. Impassable, you cannot move a model over this terrain unless it can fly. And you cannot move a model onto this terrain feature or set up a model. Basically, you can't garrison it, you can't hide you know, inside of it, that kind of stuff. Spreading disease. This faction terrain feature can never be set up within seven inches of another feculent Narlma or within three inches of an objective. Okay. And then, I mean, and, and really the value in that is it's spreading. So it's a minimum distance to the next tree. So you have to push them outward, which is cool. Uh, if this terrain feature is affected by a rule that says you cannot use the scenery rules on its war scroll for the rest of the battle, remove this terrain feature. There are a few ways, particularly with monsters, to shut down faction terrain, and so I like the inclusion of that uh, just because it makes things nice and clean. You just get rid of it. Right? No more arguing about, well, does it affect this rule? Does it affect that rule? Nope. Take it off. And then the last one is encroaching corruption. This terrain feature is treated as a friendly unit with the Magakin of Nurgle keyword for the purposes of the diseased battle trait. So if an enemy is within three inches, they will get it at the end, uh, get a disease po token at the end of the movement phase and the combat phase. Um, in addition, at the start of your hero phase, you receive one extra contagion point for each feculent gnarl maw in your army that is on the battlefield and has no enemy models within three inches of it. So what that does is it, it takes away some of the summoning capabilities because I think it was D3 before. It's just one now, which is fine. Um, to me, they don't have the same oomph or board presence or scariness that they had before because they don't allow running and charging. However, they do allow you to be near objectives, maybe some areas where your opponent doesn't want you to have any kind of influence and just deliver more and more of the disease token. So again, it's a very sharp change from what it was before. This is a thing that people are going to whine about on the internet. You can taste the salt already. But honestly, I I didn't really like that. It didn't feel nurgly to me that they could be so fast. So I like this a bit more. That's just an opinion, of course. Um, as far as their basic units, I'll do Blight Kings and also um, the, what are they, Plague Bearers. So for Blighted Weapons, Oh, sorry, I should do this. Uh, movement 4, Wounds 4, 8 Bravery, and 4 up save. Uh, the champion, same as before. He has an extra wound on him, which is nice. <laughs> um, one in every five models in this unit can be an icon bearer. Add one of the Bravery characteristics while well, it has one. One in every five can be a musician. That um, has the big bell on his back. You can reroll Battleshock rolls of one for enemy units that are within six inches of that dude. Um... Relentless attackers. Let's see. At the end of the combat phase, pick one enemy unit with a wounds characteristic of three or less that's within three inches of this unit. Roll one dice for each model in this unit that's within three inches of that enemy unit. For each roll that exceeds the enemy's wounds characteristic, it suffers a mortal wound. Okay, that's... That's a bit much, to be honest with you. And it's not, I just, I see it as something that's going to be easily forgotten. Not that it's a complicated rule. But yeah, you're, for every dude who's next to a unit or in combat, they have a chance to do mortal wounds to the enemy, which is not bad. Um, but realistically, you know, with the size of their bases, you can imagine to get three or four into combat pretty easily. And so that being said... You roll a dice for each model in that in this unit that's within three inches. So let's say four dice uh, for each roll that exceeds the, and it has to exceed it. So it's going to be on a two up minimum. Um, it does a mortal wound. To me, I see that as just kind of like an extra little freebie, because it's going to be those mortal wounds in addition to any of the disease tokens that they get because you're within three inches. Um, they're blighted weapons. It used to be they exploded on sixes into d6 attacks. They've gotten rid of that. Each one of them now does five attacks, threes to hit, threes to wound, minus one rend, and one damage. So they lost the explosions. They gained rend permanently. That used to be part of a battalion. And um, 
you know, they're just different. I really think they are. I think they want to get stuck in because when you combine um, some of the buffs that the heroes can give them to disgustingly resilient, which they would have, um, I don't know, man. They just they seem like they want to get stuck in and just keep delivering mortal wounds through various means from all over the place um, and grind your opponent out, which to me is more Nurgly. It is very different, I understand, from how they were before, but it is, to me, more, I don't know, lore-friendly. How about that? <laughs> that's, that's why you guys come here. And then let's go to the Plague Bearers as the other basic troop, and then we'll round out our discussion. Um, let's see, move into four. Two wounds each now. They used to only be one, and that is nice. Two wounds with that uh, disgustingly resilient. Nice. They got a, they got a glow up with a six up save. Save doesn't matter. It's pretty much going straight to ward. Um, let's see. Standard bearer. Let's see. If the unmodified battle shock roll for a unit that includes any icon bearers is one, you can return one slain model to that unit, and no models in that unit flee in the battle shock phase. Cool. They had that before. It wasn't quite just one model, but yeah. Um, Reroll Battleshock rolls of one for enemy units if they're near a Piper, which is the same thing as the instrument for the mortals. And then uh, Cloud of Flies. Subtract one from hit rolls for attacks that made with missile weapons that target this unit while it has more than five models in it. So that is pretty cool. I mean, they're minus one to be hit by most things at range. Their uh, profile, one attack each, which is sad. <laughs> Fours to hit, threes to wound, no rend, and one damage. But that is greatly augmented by the heroes that we had. And we saw this in, I believe, I don't think it was Wrath of the Everchosen. I think it was one of the Broken Realms books where they really leaned into buffing up Nurgle stuff. Um, let's see. Yeah, you can add to the attacks characteristic. You can improve their rend value, add one to their saves. Uh, let's see... That's from the Spoilpox Scrivener, the Sloppity Bile Piper. Uh, let's see, he can make pile in, he can have pile in shenanigans. Um, I don't know, they have a whole bunch of stuff that when you stack these buffs on top of the basic Plague Bearer unit, they become much more scary. So what I'm going to do now, like I said, I'm not going to read every single aspect of this book. We're just going to talk about it. Uh, I'm going to go up to the upward cam and we're just going to have a chat. So closing thoughts on the new Maggotkin of Nurgle Battle Tome. First of all, I'm excited about it. It's gotten me to redo this entire series, getting back into it. I'll have another episode with, you know, the stuff that I already own and kind of my vision for the future for it in a little bit. But what I will say is this book took away a lot of things, but then it added a whole heckin' ton more. And so, uh, you know, when Grandfather Nurgle closes a door, he opens a window. And so what I mean by that is the sheer aggressiveness, the actual, you know, from your deployment zone into your opponent's face, it lost a lot of that in terms of the run and charge, the the movement options that you have available to you, particularly if you're running Pusco Blight Lords are much more limited. It doesn't have that same turn one, rush the board and and be in your opponent's face. What they got, though, which I think is much more, uh, I guess, lore-friendly, if that's the term we want to use, is that they feel like Nurgle, which is, when you read the books, they're strong, they're super tough, right? Everything in this book has a 5-up uh, ward save that, when the wheel is right, can be a 4-up, and they heal a wound each round, if not D3. That's awesome. Like, what? That's so cool. So they do that at the same time, they're going to be moving towards objectives and then just sitting on them to grind your opponent out, which is also very nurgly. The army doesn't need to be the most effective in terms of raw killing power. It just needs to be there long enough for you to get sick. And that's really a thing that's been emphasized with the disease tokens and, and that form of counting and stuff like that. I want to play a few rounds with it with my friends here locally to get a sense of exactly how tedious that is. Like in terms of, you know counting how many units are affected and kind of keeping track of how much disease points they all have is it fun is it annoying as i'll get out you know like I, that's something you can only do with experience and i unfortunately haven't been able to take the book out to actually try it um but reading over what the things did before and kind of comparing them i do really like them to be honest when i initially wanted to get into a magakin of nurgle army this is the kind of stuff that i wanted like i wanted chonky boys that just don't want to die yeah, absolutely. Sign me up a million times, yes. So, you know, in terms of, like I said, you're going to see a lot of negativity online because they lost a whole lot. 
I think they gained a lot. I think the the summoning points are awesome. You know, you can easily get what six uh, six or seven a turn. You have stuff in your side of the table. You have stuff in your opponents. That's six. If there's no enemies in either one of them, you get extra ones based on that. So, like, there's a lot of ways to get summoning points. Um, it probably won't really come up a ton until round two or three. But again, that's thematic. They're bringing the garden with them. And so stuff will start popping up pretty aggressively from that point forward. Now, I'm going to have videos later on, um, probably this week, if not next week, not only dealing with the lore, because they didn't really add a whole lot of new lore, but certainly revealing, uh, sorry, reviewing kits like this guy talking about how their value of getting into the faction and stuff like that um, i do intend to build that up because it occurred to me that with the new points in the book i actually have a 2000 point nurgle army just sitting here so i was like well yeah why not so anyway i'll be doing that and i will continue this series as i do so anyway i hope you enjoyed this video leave your thoughts in the comments down below um if you're a nurgle player you know what did you win what did you lose and uh, are you the person who's going to rise to the occasion and find new strategies to find new ways to serve the Grandfather Nurgle with your collection? So let me know, and I will chat with you then. Thank you so much, and happy wargaming.